Now we come to the fourth period or section of our series on God's purpose for the believer. And we're going to find out as we go along that there is a good deal of just plain hard study involved in our becoming knowledgeable, responsible believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. He being infinite, he being God, he being the Lord Jesus, he is not going to be known just casually or by any casual means. He's only going to be known as he is revealed by the Holy Spirit, who is the Spirit of Christ. He's only going to be known as the Holy Spirit reveals him through the written word. The living word is known through the written word by the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And that takes study. We study, we use our minds, we use our accumulated knowledge, and at the same time it is all in dependence upon the Holy Spirit. It's prayerfully done. But the fact that the Holy Spirit is ministering to us does not in any way minimize the fact that we must study, as Paul said, study. Hard work. I remember a friend used to say that in college he used to study late at night, cramming. To study until his eyebrows squeaked as he moved them back and forth. He knew it was time to quit when his eyeballs began to squeak. Literally. Well, that was for a college degree. How about getting to know the Lord Jesus Christ who is our life? And God does not allow any shortcuts when it comes to reality. And that we must face up to now in this fourth section of our time together. And it's this. There is no deeper truth, so-called, no identification truth to be revealed to and shared with any believer who is not first established in the earlier truths, the growth truth, the birth truths of justification, of the fact that he's accepted in Christ by God, of the fact that he's complete in the Lord Jesus Christ. These basic truths must be rested in, must be known, must be appropriated, must be stood upon by the believer before the further truths can be entered into. There is no skipping from Romans 1 to Romans 6, for instance. Romans 3, justification. Romans uh, 4 and 5, our acceptance and all, must be, must belong to the believer in his very life before God can open up to him the truths that are beyond. Because God's truth is... Uh, uh, all geared together. It's uh, like a ladder. One rung must be stood upon before the next one can be reached. And we must not only know this for our own growth, we must realize this and be sure about this, understand this before we can take others on and share with others. So often we encounter those who want to know something about the deeper truths, want to go on with the Lord, and we seek to help them. <clears throat> but we find, and they find, that they can't really understand, and it doesn't open up to them. And they finally say, well, this uh, Romans 6 doesn't work for me. And they give up so often. 
and come to find out <clears throat> they aren't even sure about Romans 3. They aren't even sure about their security in the Lord Jesus Christ. And until they're sure of that, <clears throat> there's no real development for them. There must be the, the true foundation before there can be any superstructure, development, and growth. And the Christian who is to help the, another believer come on into the deeper truths must first make sure about that believer's stand in the basic truths of acceptance and justification and uh, not just take that for granted by any means or he'll find much of his work coming undone and for naught and the uh, friend to whom he ministered will be disillusioned and uh, harmed by it all there's much of that today no we must make sure about the individual's foundation that he is sure of it before he can go on so we are moving on into the realm of acceptance and uh, the fact that we're complete in him now <clears throat> and this brings really this really brings uh, the realization of our acceptance in the Lord Jesus and the fact that we're complete in him uh, brings real peace and rest and prepares one for healthy growth as one sees his position in the Lord Jesus and of course uh, failure in a Christian life and our needs that are created through the failure this is what creates and fosters an interest in our heart and a hunger to study and to find out I remember oh, 25 years ago early in my Christian life I had begun to see quite a bit of failure in my walk I was hungry to grow and for reality. I, I knew that the Lord Jesus had done more on the cross in my behalf than I was experiencing. I knew there was more for me in the Lord Jesus than I knew about. I knew that. And I was hungry. <clears throat> and I remember hearing a dear old gentleman share some of the things of the Lord one night in church at a prayer meeting. He'd come to minister and he he only accentuated that hunger in my heart and gave me a glimpse of what was mine in the Lord Jesus. Just a glimpse. And then he went on. I don't know where he went after that. But as far as I was concerned, that brief few moments that he shared quietly from his heart meant so much to me. and helped me to continue to reach out to him through my failure because of my failure is seeking that which I knew was in him and that which I certainly knew I needed and we've said it time and time again already here that we find out we find reality through unreality we find life through death we find victory through failure and we found this out even before we were saved this principle we came to realize that we were unacceptable to God in the first Adam and this drove us into the Lord Jesus this drove us to our justification in Him so that we might be acceptable in Him for our justification, that we might be have heaven as our home. The Lord Jesus as our Savior. 
And this same principle applies not only for our justification, but for our sanctification, for our growth. <clears throat> that we find that our old life, the self-life, is totally unacceptable to God, our Adamic nature, the nature we receive from Adam. And as we find this out through failure in our Christian life, as Christians, we are driven <clears throat> to the Lord Jesus Christ as the true vine, we learn to take our place as a branch and to begin to draw and receive life from him for our Christian walk. And God in his mercy allows us to see that there's no good thing in us, in ourselves, so that we'll find all good in the Lord Jesus. <clears throat> we think here of Ephesians 1, 5 and 6, this truth that God is able to accept us as Christians in the Lord Jesus Christ, not in ourselves, but in Him. Ephesians 1, 5 and 6, Having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the Beloved. And, dear friends, we were at our new birth, we were born into him. His nature became our nature. We became partakers of the divine nature, the very life of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it is because of our position in Him, because of the fact that He is our Savior and our Lord and our life in God's eyes, it is because of that fact that He is able to accept us. We're made accept, acceptable to God because of the Lord Jesus Christ. Not only what He did for us at Calvary, but what he is to us as our life. And it's important, uh, for instance, Romans 5.1, how important this is for us to see, this truth in Romans 5.1, a truth that we must really see before we can get anywhere near Romans 6 in our realization in our development. Romans 5, one. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God in our Lord Jesus Christ, accepted in the Beloved, God's Beloved, God's Beloved Son. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God in our Lord Jesus Christ. And this peace, peace with God, it is God's peace that God is at peace toward us. That's what this verse is saying. That as we are justified by our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and that we are placed in Him in our new birth, then God is able to be at peace with us. We are acceptable to God in our Lord Jesus Christ, in His beloved Son. And this is where our peace comes from when we come to know and understand and see that God is at peace with us. There's the secret, there's the key for our peace. When I know that my Father is at peace with me because I'm in the Lord Jesus, I can be at peace with Him because I know He accepts me. And here's something to remember and to realize. Often a Christian feels that he, that God is at peace with him when everything is going well and when uh, the Lord Jesus is working in his heart.
Then he feels that God is at peace with him, and then he's at peace with God because of these factors that things are going well. But, dear friends, things do not always go well. In God's very processing and developing of us, there is death, there is failure. The very process of God, and things do not go well. Uh, some of the most important times in our development are when things are going at their very worst. And then where is our peace? If our peace is going to be predicated upon how things are going in our lives. No, that is not the source of our peace. The source of the Christian's peace is not the Lord Jesus' work in us. The source of our peace is the Lord Jesus' work for us. That he paid the penalty of our sin. That we are now in the Lord Jesus because of the work of Calvary, because of our new birth. And that because we are in the Beloved, we are accepted by God because of His work for us, not because of His work in us. We must take our eyes off His work in us for our peace and place our eyes upon His work for us at Calvary, and then comes peace. Then we realize we're accepted by God. We cannot make peace with God by being good or rectifying or straightening anything out. We cannot make peace with God that way. And we're not required to. The Lord Jesus has uh, made peace for us. And he's made peace by the blood of his cross. The finished work. Eternally, eternally finished. There is our peace. Because that's God's peace. Having made peace by the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things to himself. And we are reconciled to the Lord Jesus. We're reconciled to God in Christ. And this is important to see, that we realize the correct source. And that we rest in that source. The work of the Lord Jesus for us is our peace, because it's God's peace. In Romans 8.1, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. because we are accepted in Him. And acceptance is from God's side. It's seen from God's side. And His attitude must be our attitude. If He accepts us, that should be enough for us. If the Lord Jesus, if God is uh, satisfied with the Lord Jesus, we should be satisfied. And there's no reason why we shouldn't be. And God says that we are accepted in his beloved. Darby, Darby says that uh, when the Holy Spirit reasons with man, he does not reason from what man is for God, but from what God is to man. Souls reason from what they are in themselves as to whether God can accept them. He cannot accept us thus. We are looking for righteousness in ourselves as a ground of acceptance with Him. We cannot get peace while reasoning in this way. The Holy Spirit always reasons down from what God is, and this produces a total change in my heart. It is not that I abhor my sins, indeed I may have been walking very well, but it is I abhor myself, the real source. This is how the Holy Spirit reasons. He shows us what we are, and that is one reason why he often seems to be very hard and does not give peace to the heart, as we are not relieved until we experientially, from our hearts, acknowledge what we are. Until the heart comes to that point, God does not give it peace. He could not. It would be healing the wound slightly. The soul has to go on until it finds there is nothing to rest on but the sheer goodness of God. And then, if God be for us, who can be against us? And that's the secret. God's attitude, God's viewpoint, how God sees us. There is our peace. And the usual 
error of Christians is this. Believers feel that when they're walking well and when they're obeying God, and God seems to be blessing, everything's going fine, then it is that God loves them and God accepts them. But when they're stumbling and when God has them in a desert area, everything's hard and dry, and there's failure, then they feel that God doesn't love them and that he doesn't accept them. And everything is uh, hinging upon their experience and uh, actually upon the Lord Jesus' work in them. And it's a fluctuating thing. So there can't be any steady peace. Peace is shattered in an instant. No, our peace, our acceptance, is in the eternal work of the cross of Calvary, what the Lord Jesus did on our behalf, and the fact that the Holy Spirit placed us in the Lord Jesus Christ. There is our peace. There is our acceptance. But we're prone to want to earn that acceptance. And we try to be certain ways and do certain things so that we can uh, rate with God. No. No. Even if we could produce, it wouldn't be enough because it would never measure up to what God has already done in giving us His Son and placing us in Him. Accepted in the Beloved. And Newell said that there is no cause in the creature why grace should be shown. There's no cause in us why God should show grace. Grace is unmerited favor. The creature must be brought off from trying to give cause to God for his love and care and acceptance. He has been accepted in the Lord Jesus Christ, who is his standing before God. He is not on probation. The Christian is not on probation. And as to the Christian's past life, it does not exist before God. The Christian died at the cross, and Christ is his life. Remember Colossians 3, For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God, Christ who is our life. Grace once bestowed is not withdrawn, for God knew all human exigencies beforehand. His action was independent of them, not dependent upon them. To hope to be better, and hence acceptable, is to fail to see ourselves in Christ only. To be disappointed with ourselves is to have believed in ourselves. To be discouraged is unbelief as to God's purpose and plan of blessing for us. God is going to work out his purpose. Let's give him the time and the freedom. We needn't be discouraged in uh, while he takes us down when we really realize how he works and what he's doing and what he already has done in Christ on our behalf. There needn't be any discouragement. We just wait. So to preach devotion first and blessing second, or as a result of our devotion, is to reverse God's order and to preach law, not grace. The law made man's blessing depend upon devotion, but grace confers undeserved, unconditional blessing because of what the Lord Jesus did and who he is and our position in him. Our devotion may follow as a result of God's grace, but does not always do so in proper measure. Yes, we are accepted in the Lord Jesus Christ. And we're not only accepted in him, but we're complete in him. This is very important. Oh, I remember years ago when I was so aware of myself in those first early years, how that crucified, how that, oh, the agony of the revelation of self. And I wondered how God could ever do anything with me. 
how he could love me, how he could accept me, because I was aware of what self was like to some degree. And then I found out that I was accepted in the Lord Jesus Christ. I found out that I was complete in Him and that He was my life and that God had already done all the work necessary to make me like His Son. And that what was happening in my development was the finished work being brought into my life. That which He had already completed in the Son who is my life. How that helped. How that enabled me to trust Him and rejoice in Him and rest in Him and cooperate with Him and fellowship with Him. That I knew He could do it because He had done it in the Lord Jesus. All complete. For in Him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily and ye are complete in Him. And we think of uh, 2 Corinthians 5.17. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creation, created in Christ Jesus. Old things are passed away in God's eyes. Behold, all things will become new in God's eyes. And we're new creatures in Christ Jesus. New creations. There's a difference between a creature and a creation. A... Uh, a worm that becomes a butterfly, a creature that becomes a butterfly, is still the same creature. It's just transformed. This isn't Christian growth. This isn't what happens to the Christian. A Christian is a new creation in Christ Jesus. He's newly created in Christ. Now the Lord Jesus is his life. He's been taken out of the first Adam. He's been given a, given a new life. Old things are passed away in God's eyes, God's economy. And behold, all things are become new. We have a brand new life in the Lord Jesus. We're recreated in him, a new creation. Not the old transformed. Start all over again. Born into Christ, born anew, a new birth created in Christ Jesus. He now is our life. And this is our beginning. This is our foundation. It is upon this basis that we grow where the life of the Lord Jesus is more and more manifest in our mortal flesh and our body because he now is our very life. Stoney said that uh, progress is only advancing in the knowledge, the spiritual knowledge, of what we really possess at the outset. That I may know him. That we find out what is ours in the Lord Jesus Christ. Progress, growth, is only advancing in the knowledge. Grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Progress is only advancing in the knowledge and the spiritual knowledge at that of what we really possess at the outset when we're born again. It is like ascending a ladder. The ladder is grace. The first step is we believe that the Lord Jesus was sent of God and the second is that in the fullness of his work we are justified and accepted. Third, we make his acquaintance. We begin to get to know him. Fourth, we come to see him in heaven. We know our association with him there and his power here. For your life is hid with Christ in God. We know our association with him there. Our citizenship is in heaven. We are seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And we get to know something of his power here. Fifth, we learn the mystery, the great things we are entitled to because of being members of his body, of being in the Lord Jesus. Sixth, that we are seated in heavenly places in Christ, and seventh, we are lost in wonder and in praise in the knowledge of himself, that I may know him. So there's no adding to a finished work. What we have to see is the fact that he is the true vine and that we are in him as branches and that he's the source of our life. Uh, this thought 
that uh, Christ's resurrection was our resurrection to a life of holiness, as Adam's fall was our fall into spiritual death. And we are not ourselves the first makers and formers of our new holy nature any more than of our original corruption. But both are formed ready for us to partake of them. And by union with Christ, the branch and the vine, we partake of that spiritual life that he took possession of for us at his resurrection. And thereby we are enabled to bring forth the fruits of it, the love, the peace, and the joy, the fruit of the Spirit. Romans 7.14 Married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit to God. Abide in me, and I in you. Well, there's a principle here we must look at about the fact that God will produce and that we needn't struggle and uh, try but that we abide and that we rest. And this is a little difficult to go through, to see here, but it's worth our attention. This thought by J.T. Beck. He said, What is needed is a mediation in which God concentrates his own peculiar spirit and life as a principle in a human individual to be personally appropriated. In a revelation, which is really to translate the divine into man's individual personal life, in truth to form men of God, the divine as such, that is, as a personal life, must first be embodied in a personal center in humanity. For this reason, as soon as something strictly new is concerned, something that in its peculiarity has not yet existed, every new type of life, before it can multiply itself to a number of specimens, must first have its full contents combined in perfect unity in an adequate new principle. And so, for the making personal of the divine among men, the first thing needed is one in whom the principle of the divine life has become personal. A seed, a center, a source, a vine. Christianity concentrates the whole fullness of revelation in the one human personality of the Lord Jesus Christ as mediator, that is, as a mediating principle of the new divine organism in its fullness of spirit and life, in and for the human personal life. With the entrance of Christ into the human individual, the divine life becomes imminent in us, not in its universal world relation, but as a personal principle so that man is not only a being made of God, but a being begotten of God, born of God. A birth, a nature. And with a growing transformation of the individual into the life, type, and image of Christ, there is perfected the development of the personal life out of God, in God, and to God. A development of not only of a moral or a theocratic communion, but a communion of nature. And the Lord Jesus is the grain of wheat. And he embodies all of life, the divine life, in himself. He is life, Christ who is our life. And we are in him. We have been planted in him. We've been born into him. And he is the source. He is the adequate principle. And all the seeds that spring from that one seed are like him. They take his nature. And there is another picture of God's purpose, that he would conform us to the image of his Son. That as we are born into him, and as we grow in him, we become like him. Because we naturally take on the same life that he has, he is. And that life is going to produce the same nature. We're going to be like him. We're born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible. And we've been planted in that seed. He, that is our life. And the question now is, the, the entire question is simply one of growth and maturity. 
The development of the divine life in the Christian is like the natural growth in the vegetable world. We do not need to make any special effort, only place ourselves under the conditions favorable to such growth. Looking unto the Lord Jesus Christ. But we all with open face beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image. As we feed the new life upon the Word and uh, concentration upon the Lord Jesus and fellowshipping with Him, there's growth. There's food. He's a living bread. And the appreciation and realization of this and the need for this, dear friends, is given to us in the mercy of God and in the love of God through failure, through the very thing that we strive to avoid. That that appreciation for Him comes through our need. And as we come to know him better, we realize that he is the one source. All that is necessary has been done by him and will be worked in us by the Holy Spirit through us. All the powers of deity which have already wrought together in the accomplishment of the first part of the eternal purpose, the revealing of the Father's perfect likeness in the man Christ Jesus, are equally engaged to accomplish the second part and work that likeness in each of God's children. That's what God is working for. That's what he's developing. That we might be more and more like the Lord Jesus Christ. And there's this progression that uh, when we're new, when we're babes in the Lord Jesus Christ, oh, we do our best and then we, what we can't really, what we lack, we depend upon him for help. But as we grow, we realize that uh, he's not going to help us. He's going to do it all as we rely upon him. Like the missionary who went out to the field to work for God in his first term. And finally, in his second term, he, by that time, he began to realize a few things, and he went out to work for God with his help. And finally, in the third term, after all these these two terms, finally came to the place where he went out to allow the Lord Jesus to work through him to do his work through him. Not I, but Christ. It took uh, the missionary eight, ten years to find this out. On the field. In the ministry. And that's easily the length of time it takes for us to really learn uh, the principle of not I, but Christ. And J. E. Conant uh, insisted that, rightly insisted, that Christian living is not our living with Christ's help. It is Christ living his life in us. Therefore, that portion of our lives that is not his living is not Christian living. And that portion of our service that is not his doing is not Christian service. For all such life and service have a human natural source. And Christian life and service have a spiritual source. And Paul said that I can do all things through Christ. For to me to live is Christ. No, God is not going to help us. He's going to do. For it is God which worketh in us, both the will and to do of his good pleasure. He didn't help us to get saved, dear friends. We had to enter into a finished work, a complete work. The Lord Jesus paid it all. He didn't help us, he did it. And he's not going to help us to live a Christian life. He's going to do it. When we stop struggling and trying, 
when we learn to rest in him as a branch should rest in the vine. And Satan's great device is to drive earnest souls back to beseeching God for what God says has already been done. We had to go beyond the help stage for justification, and the same principle holds true for our sanctification. It is not, oh, Lord, help me. It must be, Lord Jesus, I depend upon thee to live thy life in and through me. And as we go further into this series, we will come to the cross, the working of the cross, which will bring this about, that it is not I but Christ. We haven't yet approached that key, that truth, but we're approaching it. We're coming to it, inevitably. Our Lord Jesus wants to be, he waits to be wanted. And the only way we really want him is to fail. And uh, exhaust all of our own so-called resources so that we have nothing, nothing but him. That's the beginning. That's the foundation. Not I, but Christ. And he waits to be wanted and he waits to uh, be all in us and to do all through us. And he's not actually honored. He's not trusted. And he's not uh, glorified by our continually asking him for help. We make a helper out of him. I was a plumber's helper once. I know of something of what it means to be a helper. And God is not a helper. My father and your father, is a, he's all. He's life itself. He draws from uh, finished work all that he's finished in the Lord Jesus at Calvary and in the resurrection and the ascension, our risen Lord Jesus, who is our life. And he's not a helper. He does everything. And that's, uh, that's what glorifies and honors him as we abide in him and receive from him and let him uh, reveal himself and manifest himself for what he is and for what he's done. And in the face of my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus, how can we beg for help when he promises uh, that he'll supply all our need? That's why he allows us to fail to create that need doesn't supply all our wants and our selfish acquisitions. No. He supplies what he sees we need. And we need Jesus. <laughs> we need the Lord Jesus Christ, don't we? That's what God supplies. My God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory. And the more we know about his riches and glory in Christ Jesus, the more we're going to expect from him. The more we're going to uh, cease from trying to produce because we know he's already produced. And there's rest. There's abiding through that knowledge, through that realization. There's where our study comes. Our responsibility is to see in the word all that is ours in the Lord Jesus Christ and then thank and trust him for that which we need as we need it. Tozer uh, said that uh, we are forever asking God to do things that he either has already done or cannot do because of our unbelief. We plead for him to speak when he has already spoken and uh, is at that very moment speaking. We ask him to come when he is already present and waiting for us to recognize him. Without faith it is impossible to please him. And dear Andrew Murray, Dear Andrew Murray said that even though it is slow and with many a stumble, the faith that always thanks him, not for experiences, but for the promises on which we can rely, goes on from strength to strength, still increasing in the blessed assurance that God himself will perfect his work in us. 
that's what that's the attitude that God wants that we simply continue on thanking him for what he has done on our behalf in the Lord Jesus and being willing to wait for him to develop that in our daily life and we think of uh, Philippians 1 6 that wonderful truth being confident in this very thing that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it unto the day of Jesus Christ and that good work is let us make man in our image that we may be conformed to the image of his son who is the express image of God let us make man in our image our image the image of God the image of the Lord Jesus Christ who is the image of God he that has seen me has seen the Father God the Son so we have this truth that we are accepted in the Lord Jesus Christ we are complete in the Lord Jesus Christ so he is our center. He is our source. He is our vine. And the more we find out about him, the more confidence we have in him. And the more we realize we're going to receive from him, the less we'll try to produce through effort and struggling and trying and pleading and begging we don't have to be beggars with God. We simply have to be branches abiding in the vine so that the life may flow, that the Lord Jesus might be more and more fully seen in and through us. Our Father, we thank Thee for these few moments together. We thank Thee for what Thou hast done in the Lord Jesus on our behalf and the fact that thou hast placed us in him eternally as our life and that he is in us that union of life of nature which produces growth how we thank thee for this how we look to thee for the development of this in our lives day by day. We wait upon thee, Father, for all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.